This online episode is made possible by the support of the Mulch and Soil Council. To assure the products you use are properly labeled, conform to industry standards, and are tested for contaminants like arsenic, insist on mulch and soil with the council certification seal on the package. Just a few generations back, people that grew food and garden did so without the use of pesticides and chemicals. But today, they're so common in agriculture and home gardening that almost every person in the United States has pesticide residue in their body. Today, we visit the farm where modern organic gardening was born and find out why getting back to those roots is vital for a healthy planet. And you know what they say, an apple a day. Well, Chef Nathan Lyon is cooking with apples. All that more today on Growing a Greener World. Did you check out that, Bill? Awesome. You think it works? Let's try it. Go for it. Yeah, right. Oh. This program was funded by the following. Fiskars designs ergonomic products that empower gardeners to accomplish their goals. At Fiskars, we believe that all things, even the simplest, can be made better and smarter. This program is sponsored in part by Burpee Home Gardens, providing garden-ready vegetable and herb plants, backed by the 125-year heritage of Burpee. Available at your local garden center. At Live with Bents, we work in harmony with nature to help protect your garden, your family, and your pets with all natural, environmentally friendly animal repellents and lawn and garden products. Live with Bents, all natural products to help you address some of nature's most difficult problems. Subaru was the first U.S. automotive assembly plant to be designated a wildlife habitat, a fact that Coyote, Beaver, Blue Heron, and all of our other neighbors appreciate too. Subaru, a proud sponsor of Growing a Greener World. Thanks to more interest in taking care of the health of our planet and ourselves, the term organic is becoming a lot more popular and even chic in many cases. Consumers are waking up to the potential hazards of using synthetic chemicals to quickly grow that perfect looking vegetable or plant. Unfortunately, the impact to our environment and our health is now more clearly understood and those consequences have us taking a second look at how we farm and garden and even at the decisions we make in our everyday lives. For the Rodale family in rural Pennsylvania, the writing was already on the wall back in the early 40s. One man's devotion to organic agriculture and healthy living has evolved into the world's leading multimedia company with a focus on his dedication to restoring a healthy planet. Almost 70 years later, granddaughter and CEO Maria Rodale, along with her daughter Maya, are working harder than ever to advance that mission. Well, when my grandfather, J.I. Rodell, uh, came up with the organic idea in America, um, he was really concerned about his health. Um, he had a lot of personal health issues, and he just fundamentally believed that not only the food he ate, but how that food was grown could have a major impact on his health. And there was a number of people in England at the time who were talking about this, and, and um, he read a lot of books from people in England and brought that idea here and launched Organic Gardening Magazine in 1942. In 1946, he started the Rodale Institute. And the reason he started the Institute was because at the time, scientists and academia were so enthralled with chemicals and you know, science that um, he knew he had to start doing research and proving that organic was a viable solution for our future. In my grandfather's time, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, there was no thing like Whole Foods. <laughs> there, uh, organic wasn't even a government regulated label. It was just an idea. And if you look at it over time, we have made amazing progress. And the fact is now, most of the scientific research that's independent is coming out against chemicals, against genetically modified organisms. And 
the health effects of those chemicals is devastating. So I feel like we're right on the cusp of a huge change, but it's gonna take all of us uniting together to demand that change. It's also important to know why it's important to do that. And to me, looking at all the scientific research that's out there, the number one reason why it's important to demand organic and to make that change in our lives is because of our health and the health of our children. So it's really important that we start getting that information out to people so that they know that the choice they're making is the right choice for all of our futures. We have to talk to our congressmen, we have to, we have to uh, buy organic food, we have to um, get involved in our local communities and make change wherever we go. I really believe we all need to vote with our dollars. Every dollar we spend sends a message to the, both the companies that create the products and the government that looks at wh where we spend our money. And when we vote with our dollars, we're creating change. So every dollar you spend really matters. I think the USDA organic label is one of the most important labels that we have as a country. It took 20 years to develop, and while it's under pressure from companies to soften the regulations, it's under just as much pressure from people in the organic community who want to say, oh, local is better than organic, or, you know, I'm beyond organic. The more we can all unite around the USDA organic label and protect it, keep it safe, keep it pure, the more people can trust that label when they go into the supermarkets. And for most people in America, that's the primary thing they see and need to be able to trust. Maria, third generation Rodale, mm -hmm. all this emphasis, all your life, on sustainable agriculture, organic living, healthy, everything. What is it like growing up here as a kid? <laughs> it was so much fun. I wish every kid had the chance to grow up on an organic farm because, you know, you get to play outside all day and eat vegetables straight from the vegetable patch and we had tons of animals. So it, it was great and I didn't realize that it was unusual until I went to school and kids started making fun of me. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, here we are on a 333-acre farm that your parents found, mm -hmm. what, about 40 years ago? Mm -hmm. And at the time, your grandfather's vision, because now this is the Rodale Institute location, mm -hmm. was one thing. Mm -hmm. And today, is it something different? Yeah. Uh, when he started, it was really about creating an example of what an organic farm could be and how it could work. and you know, inviting people to come and see it. When my father took over, it was really about doing the scientific research that proves that organic is viable, mm. profitable, and better for people in the environment. And now, I feel like we've proven that. So now our mission really is to get the word out and to get the message to farmers that it's possible, it's profitable, get to get the message to people around the world that it's better and it's great and it's doable and it tastes great. Yeah, <laughs> and as far as getting the message out, your book, Organic Manifesto. Mm -hmm. When I read that, I could feel the passion coming out of your words. Oh, and I know that your grandfather and your father would have been very proud mm -hmm. of that. Who did you write this book for, and why did you write it? I really wrote the book for everyone, but mainly people who were confused and didn't know what the right thing to do was and wanted to understand why it's important and how we got into this position. Um, and I also wrote it for me because the best way to learn about something is to really delve into it and research it and write about it. Um, but hopefully it's a book for everyone that um, anybody who picks it up can learn something and understand why organic is so important, why we have to demand organic. As a family affair, immersing the next generation into the culture is serious business. It starts at the bottom, and family members work their way up. Maya Rodale is generation four and daughter of Maria. She's been engrossed in the company her entire life and actively involved in its leadership today. Maya, these beds behind us represent part of the farming systems trials that was started by your grandfather, what, in 1981? That's right. 
and he wanted to show scientifically the importance of organic gardening. But mm -hmm. here we are, you know, like 30 years later, and it's every bit as important now as it was back then, isn't it? It's more than ever. And when he started this, there weren't any other institutions or very many other institutions that were studying organic very seriously and very rigorously and in comparison to conventional. And we found out so much. And one of the highlights, I think, is about the yields. This is particularly important to farmers and to people who care about eating. We hear a lot about you know, can organic feed the world? We need to feed the world. And what we found after nearly 30 years of side-by-side -side comparison is that organic yields match or surpass conventional. And even better is that during years of drought, organic crops really hold their own. And also in periods of excessive moisture as well, mm -hmm. they tend to deal with that water issue better, don't they? Yeah, we talk a lot here about healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people and equals a healthy planet. And in, or, in an organic system, it's really about the strength and fertility of the soil. So we're putting a lot of organic matter in there, lots of roots, which holds the soil together. So that can hold in moisture, which will help in a year of drought. It also prevents erosion. And then in years of extreme moisture, we have a strong network of roots that can um, preserve the soil and keep it where we want it to be. Mm. And our existence depends on the soil. And we need it to be available to grow in and we need it to be healthy and strong because that, you know, it provides, it's the, it's the bed for those crops. And that's the foundation for our own health. Yeah. And, you know, again, if you care about eating, you should really need to care about the health and strength of the soil. I've always known organic. You could say I don't know anything else or I don't know anything better. Um, but what really makes me thrilled and does give me the inspiration to keep going is seeing how far the organic movement has come. We have strict organic standards now that mean something in the marketplace. And we have such an increased awareness about it. When my great-grandparents and grandfather was talking about it, they got laughed at, and now it's cool. Yeah. I had a patch from my backpack from my grandmother, I'm sorry, my grandfather, that said I was organic when organic wasn't cool. <laughs> One thing we see out here at the Institute is a growing resurgence of interest in organic from people of my generation. They want to learn about how they can garden organically in their backyard, and some of them even are out here because they want to start farming organically, so they come to our field days. And a lot of what we do here that's vital to our mission is taking what we learned from something like FST and making that available to people who can really make a difference in the world. One of the best parts about the Farming Systems Trial is the ability to see firsthand the difference between healthy soil and not so healthy soil. And we've got an example here. Right now, Maya, we've got conventional soil. Now, conventional soil would be typically probably what most people at home would have if they're not organic gardeners because mm -hmm. it's the basic chemicals, right? Right. Then we have organic soil. Now it looks the same to me, but there's clearly a difference here. Right now it looks the same, but when we add the water, we'll see what a big difference um, there is between the two soils. Okay. So do you want to put the conventional All in? Right. I'll do the organic. Okay, so just place just it in there. It in. Right now, <laughs> it's bubbly. <laughs> That's what just the you air. Can see, yeah, it's just the air. What you can see with our conventional soil right here is you can watch it mm -hmm. falling apart. Yeah. There's no structure. In contrast, the organic soil is holding together really nicely, and that's because of the root system from our cover crops and because of the carbon sequestered from our composted manure. This has been weakened by chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't had the cover crop, so it doesn't have that same root structure or organic matter. And already, in the few seconds that this has been in the water, this is already cloudy. As you said, it's breaking down. It's cloudy, and that's still clear. And I'll, I can just see it crumbling right here. Now, oh, look at that. Look how, oh my gosh. <laughs> There's nothing to hold it together. Right. So in a runoff or a wet environment, all of this is running off the sediment. Any potential contaminants are leaving yeah. the system. It's, Whereas here, look at that. That's rather, that's rather solid. It's strong. Yeah. It's staying where we want it to be. It's a great foundation for our crops. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the water doesn't have the runoff. Yeah. So um, we're not having issues with erosion that we have, um, as you can see here with this. It's, it, there's no structure. Yeah. And clearly, healthy soil results and shows up in the success of healthy plants. Exactly. 
Okay, so here's the pop quiz. I have corn on my left and corn on my right. Now, if I were to ask you which one was grown conventionally, you know, the one with all the fertilizer and chemicals, well, you'd probably say this one. But you know what? You'd be wrong because this is the organic corn. And the cool thing about it is, look at this. This was even started two months before this one. So the proof really does show up in the plants. So my uh, over 60 years now of researching organic farming and gardening methods. You kind of think maybe by now you knew it all, but I know you haven't. What's next? We, we do feel that we've shown so many benefits of organic in comparison to conventional, and now we're studying how we can refine those organic methods even further. And the fact of the matter is most farmland in America is still conventionally produced and we have a lot of acres left to transition. Yeah, and then that information can apply on a smaller scale to the home gardener. Absolutely. What do you think that your great-grandfather would say to you if he were here right now? I think he would be so darn proud to see how far the organic movement has come, and I think he'd be so thrilled that his family is carrying that legacy on, and that all the people that have believed in it and made this possible. Yeah. What would you say to him? I would say thank you. He really pioneered organics and you know, he was ridiculed. It was, it was a battle and he made a great difference in this world. And I think it's an honor to be able to carry on that legacy. And it's a big responsibility, isn't it? Yes, but it's an important job. Someone's got to do it. <laughs> The Rodale Institute has been a trailblazer for testing ideas and methods on how to grow plants and trees without pesticides. And because so many people doubted that you could even grow certain fruit trees without pesticides, that's just the kind of challenge Rodale loves to take on. Jeff, you're the farm director here at Rodale. Yes, and I've been here almost 35 years now. We're here in uh, the apple orchard. Yes. Where you test out different organic methods of growing these apple trees. Yeah, we've done a lot of experimentation with, with growing apples. I mean, one of the things we wanted to do when we decided to grow apples was challenge ourselves to grow something that was a little more difficult than just vegetables or some of the grain crops that we see on the farm. Now, a lot of farmers think that's challenging, but we've moved way beyond that. We wanted to grow a crop that was uh, perennial in nature because most of our other crops we can rotate, so that helps us to manage the disease. With apple trees, can't do that. They stay in one place. So. Uh, growing apples is a different sort of challenge than many of the other crops we grow on the farm. And a lot of commercial apple growers just swear by these pesticides and of course you know that's harming us Correct. when we eat those apples. What are some of the things that you learned in your testing on how to grow apples organically? Well it's, in re it's really important for an orchardist whether you're a backyard orchardist or a commercial orchard to start out right. So we started out by managing our soil for at least 15 years organically before we ever planted the apple trees. So in, apple nutrition or tree nutrition is not a problem for us. We just, the trees grow like crazy. In fact, they're growing too fast. We can't, we can't stop them from producing as much wood as, as they do. The other thing we did was we decided to start with disease resistant cultivars. That means we chose varieties of apples that are not susceptible to some of the major diseases that apples get, like apple scab. Well, Jeff, you have definitely been a pioneer in growing organic produce and sharing that knowledge with all of us. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure to share it with you. The apple, amongst my top 10 favorite fruit but also one of the tops on the Dirty Dozen. That's why I always buy organic when it comes to apples. I mean, they're so easy, they're versatile. Take them anywhere. Kids' lunches, bake them in apple pies. And that's when I'm gonna use these delicious apples for one of my favorite things to make, which is spiced applesauce. And I'll pair it with an amazing seared pork tenderloin. Let's get started. Now with apples, really simple preparation for this applesauce. Just gonna quarter them, just like this and then dice them. And the reason why I'm saving the skins, it's probably 80% of all the fiber is in the skin. Plus I like a little bit of extra texture when I have some applesauce. Now I'll pop these in a bowl. Now if you don't get to them right away, it's always good to squeeze a little lemon, lemon juice on top of them. That'll keep the apples nice and fresh looking. 
keeps that vibrant flavor going on all day long. These go right into this pot. Here we go. We're gonna add a little bit of flavor. How about some brown sugar? Not too much, it already has plenty of sugar, but brown sugar kind of reminds me of Thanksgiving. And since it's fall, I like that flavor. Just maybe a tablespoon, that's all it takes. A little bit of cinnamon stick. Now I'm using cinnamon stick because I want to taste it as I go, as it cooks. If I put too much cinnamon powder in it, if there's too much, it's already too much. So I can add a couple of cinnamon sticks. And when it's perfect for me, my fan, pull it out. There we are. And how about some apple cider? Real stuff, seasonal and delicious. That goes in. Some salt and pepper, a little bit of salt, and some fresh ground black pepper. And one of my favorite things to do with applesauce is fresh ginger. Now the fastest and easiest way to peel ginger is actually with the back of a spoon, okay? I'm gonna put it down and just push away from me with my thumb, just like that, and the skin will come right off. You don't waste all that by using a peeler, and the rest of it goes inside the applesauce. Use the trusty Disney microplane, love this thing. Here we are. Look how much came out, just like that. Nice and fresh. And that goes in there too. Pop a lid on there, and I would say medium heat for about 15 minutes, and we'll just mash it up and we're ready to go. All right, so the applesauce is well underway. Now we're onto that delicious pork tenderloin. So to spice things up, a little bit of salt and pepper, just like normal, everything needs a little bit of seasoning and cumin, powdered cumin is amazing. Just a little bit of powdered cumin. It's like smoky and sweet and it's gonna pair perfectly with the spiced applesauce. And in it goes. That is the sound that I love. Now I'm gonna let this sit for about a minute. I'll turn it, about a minute, and turn it, and that caramelizes each side. And the last minute, I'll put a probe in there. And this is what I'm talking about, a digital thermometer. I'll set it for 145, pop it in the oven, about 10 to 12 minutes later, it's gonna be perfect. All right, right now the pork is actually resting. When I pulled the pork out of the oven, when I looked at the digital thermometer, it read 145, which is okay, because by the time I pull it out and let it rest, the temperature keeps going up. It went as high as 158. It'll still be a little bit pink, but that's totally safe. And the last thing I have to do is just smash up this applesauce. I like a little bit of rustic. Potato masher works perfectly for this. Just like that. And don't forget to pull out the cinnamon sticks, guys. All right, that's great. It's nice and rustic, delicious, and you can smell that ginger and cinnamon. It's gonna be perfect. Now, the pork is done resting. All right. And that's enough for the whole crew. No pork and applesauce, there's never a better pair. Here we are, just like this. And some of the pork right along the side. And for a touch of color, how about some fresh thyme? And there we are, everyone. And there we go. Delicious pork tenderloin with spiced applesauce. And you can find this recipe and all my others at growingagreenerworld.com. Thanks to the Rodale Institute and vision of J.I. Rodale decades ago, along with the current leadership of Maria and Maya Rodale and their family, educating generations on making healthy choices for the food we grow and eat is saving lives and helping to heal our planet. Seeing is believing, and I hope that after today we've made a believer out of you too. You really can grow a greener world without all the chemicals. And in the words of Robert Rodale, healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people. If you'd like more information on organic gardening or how to get started, visit our website where we've assembled lots of information. Along with all the videos and Chef Nathan's cooking recipes. And the address is the same as our name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. I'm Joe Lample. And I'm Patty Moreno. And we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World. Now you know this is a cutting garden, right? It's beautiful. Did you bring the scissors? No, you didn't? Patty, I told you to bring the oh. scissors. You could have gotten so much stuff here. 
look at this. This program was funded by the following. Fiskars designs ergonomic products that empower gardeners to accomplish their goals. At Fiskars, we believe that all things, even the simplest, can be made better and smarter. This program is sponsored in part by Burpee Home Gardens, providing garden-ready vegetable and herb plants, backed by the 125-year heritage of Burpee. Available at your local garden center. At Liquid Fence, we work in harmony with nature to help protect your garden, your family, and your pets with all natural, environmentally friendly animal repellents and lawn and garden products. Liquid Fence, all natural products to help you address some of nature's most difficult problems. Subaru was the first U.S. automotive assembly plant to be designated a wildlife habitat, a fact that coyote, beaver, blue heron, and all of our other neighbors appreciate too. Subaru, a proud sponsor of growing a greener world. To order the Green Gardener's Guide for information on gardening and living green, for $16.95 plus shipping and handling, visit growingagreenerworld.com slash books. This program is presented by Blue Ridge PBS.